This video is the third in the series of videos that shows you how to set up a virtual Windows computer in the cloud using Amazon Web Services. In this third video, we focus on getting connected to that instance. What you're looking at on my screen here is a table of all of the instances that I have running. And the instance that we created last time is this one that we named instance number one. That's the very last one in this table. This table looks a little different than it did when I finished up the last video because some of the other instances that I have running have either been deleted or renamed. If you're doing this for the first time, you should only have one instance in this table, and that's the one that we created during the last video. Now, in case you have navigated away from this table and don't know how to get back, I want to show you that very quickly here. When you log into Amazon Web Services, you will normally end up at the console home, which contains links to all of the services that Amazon offers. Creating these virtual computers is done using the EC2 service, so we'll go ahead and click on that link. And when you click on that link, you end up at this summary page um, that shows you how many instances you have running and so on. We actually use this page to create our instance at the beginning of the last video using this blue launch instance button. But to get to the console that shows you about all of your instances, you're going to want to look to the left here under the Instances category and click on the Instances link, and that will take you back to the table. Now before we actually go ahead and connect to the instance, I want to remind you of a couple of other things we did uh, last time. In particular, under the uh, folder for the course, I created a special folder which I called instance data where I'm going to save information about these instances. Uh, in particular, in the process of creating the instance, we were prompted to download a file relating to our key pair and we saved that file in this instance data folder uh, under the name instance one key pair.pem, P-E-M. I also suggested that you create an Excel file to store all of the information about the instances. We're not really thinking here that we're only going to create one of these virtual computers, but we're probably going to actually create many of them over time, and we want to uh, make sure that we can keep everything straight. So I suggested that you create this Excel file and in this Excel file, store information about the instance. For example, we stored its name, instance number one, its unique Amazon Web Services ID, uh, its uh, DNS name, which is like the, the name of the, of the website or the computer. So uh, this DNS name is, is a little bit complicated here, but it's playing the same role that, for example, uh, Google.com does for Google. Uh, it's the name of the address that takes you to that computer. Here's the corresponding IP address that these names get translated into. And in a minute, we're going to fill in the login, which is uh, administrator is the name of the login. And we're going to go ahead and need uh, the password as well. So we created this file and saved the information into it and downloaded the PEM file into this folder called instance data. So now I'm going to go back to the table of instances and very quickly show you where that information came from. The public DNS name is in this column right here, and the IP number is in the, the column that's next to it. The unique instance ID is right over here in the second column. So that's where that data came from. So now we're ready to connect to our instance. And to do that, the first thing we have to do is select the instance, and then we can click on the Connect button. And when you click on the Connect button, you're going to get this dialog pop up. And the first thing it's going to do is offer for you to download the remote desktop file. So we're going to go ahead and click on that button and download that file. 
and we need to save it in the same folder or I recommend that you save it in the same folder that you are saving all of the other information about the instances. Now when you click download you may get a different folder but I'm assuming you're going to be able to navigate to the folder where you saved the previous data. The uh, remote desktop file will be automatically named using the IP number of that computer and I think it's probably a good idea to change that to the same name uh, that you used for the computer so this is instance um, number one dot RDP and I'm going to go ahead and then save that so in my instance data folder I now have three files I have the PEM file I have the Excel file where I'm going to keep information about all the instances that I create and I'm going to have this remote desktop file, the RDP file, which I have named instance number one. Now, uh, going back to this dialog that popped up where we downloaded the remote desktop file, I also get information about connecting and it gives me the username administrator and I'd already put that into the database. And then it gives me a button that says get password. Well, I need my password, so I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And it will come up with a dialog here that says that this instance was created with a key pair name called instance one key bear pair dot pem. And what it's going to ask me to do is to retrieve that file. So I'm going to go down here to this button that says choose file and click on that. And then I'm going to navigate to this folder where I've stored all of the instance data. And I'm going to select the file that says instance one key pair dot pem and go ahead and click open. Now when I open that, it's going to load a private key into this text box that's right here and this is a very long thing so uh, as you can see from the slider over here it's only showing you part of it so um, even if you were to try to write down and type all this stuff you couldn't steal the password here but I'm going to go ahead and click decrypt password and it gives me the automatically generated password for um, the account okay and it's a complicated thing here so I'm gonna click on that until it's completely selected and then hit control C to copy it on the keyboard and then I'm going to go put it in my database for the instance so I'm going to go ahead and, and click under password here and do control V and so now I have saved the administrator the login name administrator and the corresponding password and I'm going to save out the Excel file by hitting control S on the keyboard so now I can go back to my um, window here and close it because I'm finally ready to connect to the virtual computer that we have created. So go ahead, go ahead and close that. And then I'm going to open up the folder where I have the instance data. And I can connect to this computer by double clicking on the remote desktop file, which will launch remote desktop automatically and then connect me um, to the computer. So I just double clicked on it and uh, I'm going to get a warning um, box come up uh, that the software has unknown publisher but I don't care about that. Go ahead and click connect. And now I have the um, window where I need to uh, enter my credentials so it's already loaded up that the user is administrator so I need to go ahead and put in the password. So I'll pull up my database file I will select the cell where the password is, click control C to copy it, go back to my remote desktop program here which is uh, represented by this icon in the in the taskbar and then I'm going to do control V to um, paste in that password and then I can go ahead and click OK and I get another warning box about certificates but again um, I don't really need to worry about that right now so I'm just going to go ahead and click yes to connect and I'm going to wait for a little bit here and what will happen is I get the screen uh, I get connected to my my uh, virtual computer in the cloud now it's possible that when you connect your screen won't look exactly like this 
what's happened is that remote desktop has essentially taken over your entire screen so that it's almost as though that remote computer uh, were uh, connected directly to the screen in front of you. It kind of is like it's taken over your computer. So if your screen doesn't look quite like this, don't worry about it right now. Uh, I want to show you how to get back to your regular computer. What you'll see in the top is this little bar. And this bar actually slides around, uh, incidentally, so you can move it out of the way if you can't see things. But you can reduce the size of this so that it doesn't uh, take over your entire screen. And if you do that, what you'll see is that now the connection to your remote computer is now just in a window uh, like any other program on your computer. And you can see when I did that, you can see our Excel file, which is now on my notebook computer in front of me. Um, that program is there. My remote desktop connection is, is down here. So I can always get back to my regular computer, so to speak, by using these buttons here that either completely minimize the remote desktop or merely shrink it down into a window. Now, on server 2012, you will be running Windows 8. And it's possible that you don't have any experience with Windows 8, in which case the screen that is in front of you is, is something new. Um, in Windows 8, the idea of the start menu has been replaced by the idea of a start screen with now these graphical shortcuts instead of uh, text-based links. And in the Windows 7 start menu, um, there was a list of programs. The programs now in Windows 8 can be found by clicking on this down arrow that's at the bottom here. So if I click on that, you'll see that I get a list of all of the programs that are on this computer. And they don't call them programs anymore, they call them apps. So I can slide along and see uh, everything that's there. If I want to get back to the first screen, I can click on this up arrow. Now it's quite possible that your screen doesn't look anything like that. Instead, it's come up with the desktop. Okay, so this desktop is pretty much like any Windows desktop, only it's got this solid uh, black uh, background. And I can get back to the start screen by going down and clicking on the Windows symbol in the lower left-hand corner here, and I get the start screen. Okay, I can also toggle between these two screens just by hitting the Windows button on the computer keyboard. So if I hit that button, I'll flip to the desktop, and then I'll flip back to the start screen. One other thing I should show you is that in addition to the start screen and the list of apps, formerly the list of programs, there is also something called charms. And if I mouse down into this corner over this little minus sign, um, what will happen is a bar will uh, jump up on the right-hand side that uh, allows me to do searching, but also work on the settings here. Um, so that's a useful thing to know. All right, now the last thing I want to do before closing this video is to look and see what our situation is with re respect to disk space. So to do that, I'm going to go ahead and go to the desktop, which I could do by clicking right here on this desktop icon, or the way I'll actually do it is just to hit the Windows button. So I flip there. And I can go ahead now and click on the little folder icon here, which which should uh, open up the file explorer, the Windows uh, file explorer, Windows Explorer versus Windows Internet Explorer. And uh, up it comes. I've ac accidentally launched two of them here. So let me go ahead and close one of them. And you can see that I've come up in the, um, the location of this PC. And down here is my disk drive, which should have been 30 gigabytes of uh, SSD, solid state disk, rather than a, a spinning magnetic disk. So uh, if I look at that now, you'll see that I have used, just with the software that's uh, essentially the operating system, I've used uh, 20 
um, 9.6 gigabytes, or I said 12.1 free of, of the 30 gigabytes. So everything else I install on this solid state drive uh, has to fit within that 12 gigabytes. Um, I can, of course, add additional storage to this computer using the console. Uh, we're not going to go ahead and worry about that yet at this point. Uh, but I did want to show you that you do have that 30 gigabytes that uh, was mentioned in the setup, but that the vast, vast majority of that has already been used by the software that is on the system. So this concludes our step three in the process of setting up your virtual computer, which was uh, how to connect to the computer.